Texas Senator Ted Cruz says every mass shooting, every mass shooting is the result of mental health issues, unresolved mental health issues. Ted Cruz says that because he takes more money from gun lobbyists than any other lawmaker in Washington. He is telling us not to demonize the gun manufacturers. Ted Cruz instead tells us demonize the mentally ill, demonize the mentally ill so he can help his sugar daddies sell more assault weapons. I don't need to remind my listeners that this year Ted Cruz has had a deal with a genuine mental illness crisis in his own family. Even Ted Cruz deserves his privacy, so I'll leave it at that. I wish his family much healing. But considering what Ted Cruz as a father is going through right now, he should be the last person in America stigmatizing mental illness by making it synonymous with gun violence. Gun violence is not a symptom of untreated mental illness. It is a symptom of easy access to guns, period. In fact, those of us suffering from mental illness are more likely to be the victims rather than the perpetrators of gun violence. According to a recent article in the Journal of American Medicine, Americans suffering from SMI, that would be severe mental illness, SMI, Americans suffering from severe mental illness are 11 times more likely to be the victims of violent crime than the general population, with nearly a quarter of Americans who suffer from severe mental illness reporting that they have been physically assaulted. Now, why is that? Because the severely mental, mentally ill here in America have trouble finding work, they've been stigmatized, they have trouble finding housing, and way too many end up living on the streets or in communities where they are more vulnerable to violent assault. What Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, pretends not to understand is that severe mental illness is chronic and can't really be cured. It must be treated over a lifetime, and that requires easy access to medicine and talk therapy. But in America, mental health treatment is for profit, especially in Greg Abbott's Texas, which means mental health treatment is unavailable to those who can't afford it which is practically everybody. For those with what is considered good health insurance, here in America, even with good health insurance, it is next to impossible finding a psychologist or a psychiatrist in your network. Most mental health professionals reject the insanity of our health insurance system. They refuse to wait for health insurance companies to reimburse them. That's why most mental health patients go out of pocket with the hope of one day having their insurance company get around to paying them back. That's how it works here in America. Mental health is like dental. Only the truly privileged are entitled to a cleaning. The severely mentally ill, they have nobody to talk to. But every television show, every politician says, if you or someone you know is struggling with an eating disorder or suicidal thoughts, call the number on the screen. Have you ever called the number on the screen? Hey, I have a gambling problem, so I called the number on the screen. Can you please send a psychologist over to my home immediately? Oh, you can't? You don't have psychologists who make house calls? Well, can you make an appointment for me at a nearby clinic that treats gambling addiction? And oh, by the way, make sure it doesn't cost me anything because I have a gambling problem. I have no money. 
You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. I'll help you look for it. Yeah, I don't know where I put it. I've lost yeah. faith. I, I've, check, I sh- check all your pockets for your faith. I do that with my will to live. <laughs> Jose Arroyo. <laughs> Checking my pockets all the time. So I'm going to give you the, I'm going to embarrass you. Jose oh, Arroyo please. is an Emmy Award winning comedy writer. He's written for Conan for 20 some odd years. He wrote for uh, Bill Maher show, Dennis Miller show. He's written books and he's a cartoonist. And most importantly, he's published in The New Yorker. He's a failed cartoonist. No, I, before we... Isn't that what you bring me on for, I, I, David? Isn't that what you... You I love have, to wallow in all my rejected cartoons, uh, which is funny. We were just talking about Chris Christie, and the first cartoon I was going to show you was sort of about like how you know some things are now taboo, and it was um, these two soldiers dragging out a king's court jester, and he's telling the one coming in, "Politics, yes. Kings, wait, no." <laughs> So it's it's just lined up with what you were saying, you know. Um, no, that was. Let me just set this. Up. So that is a cartoon that you submitted to the New Yorker. Yes. And yes. my sister sends me all your cartoons that are in the New Yorker, uh, and we're not interested in those, Jose. <laughs> in those, because I have one here. No, 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 is because it reminds me that there is no justice in the world. <laughs> that that every cartoon you show me is I, I'm jealous of the brilliance. Oh please! But please. I'm not envious and resentful because it's been rejected. So it it makes me feel good that you've uh, been rejected. Feel good. I get that. I get that. That sort makes of me a protective of you as opposed to. Freude. Yeah. Yeah. So I get that. So shall we begin? Well, OK, sounds good. Now, I mean, <laughs> you think it's an injustice. Some of these might change your mind. You're going to go, oh, maybe the New Yorker. Good. I love false humility. That's always a good way to set this up. That's that's right. So this one's kind of a New York uh, centric. This is a, a guy on a ledge in New York City. Uh, the, the fireman is calling up to him and it says, the crowd wants to know which apartment might become available. <laughs> That's for you guys. That's a great, and that was rejected. Well, I think it's, I mean, the topic is suicide or a person in danger. I figured if, it, you know, if they ran it in an, in a, in an issue that talked about some serious issue like that, they wouldn't want to make light of it. I, I understand it, but it was funny to me because I remember there was a whole thing about people in New York checking the obituaries to yes. see who died and what apartments were becoming available. It's, it, yeah, it's grim, but uh, yeah. but it felt real. Yes. Um, here's one. I, my favorite kind of cartoon is one without words, where you just sort of get get it with just the visual. Um, anyway, this is a turtle pushing the close button on an elevator as a rabbit. <laughs> That. All right, wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah. That is genius. Well, I if I had maybe because I, I had to explain it to you, maybe they, you know, they, but they hold it up there. Thousands. Hold it up there for a second, David. They get thousands of these. <laughs> but that is as funny as I'll tell you. You know, well, okay, that's genius. I appreciate I'm that. I'm so glad it got that. rejected. I, I know Thank I'm you. making the night. 
Thank I'm you. making that. I get that. I All right. So that. here's There's... one. Uh, just a, a Roman soldier at a bar, clearly. And he's just saying, I miss the BC. <laughs> Better time for Roman soldiers. Wow. Um, here, I don't know if I did this one in the, the last time I was here, uh, David, but it was it got a lot of um, a lot of love on on my Instagram. So what I do is I get rejected at the New Yorker. And then from time to time, I just post the rejects onto my Instagram. Well, why don't page. you make like a book of these? I, I, I certainly have enough. <laughs> I can make a series of books. Um, so this is a, a, a minotaur. Uh, asleep in bed, and he's just doing a book of mazes. <laughs> That's no. Hang on, hang on. That hang reaction on. is perfect. That's actually how the New York reacted. Hang on, it's let me let, don't, 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 don't explain bed. it to me. Hang on, do do, do not explain. Huh? It's a minotaur doing a book of mazes. Can somebody in the comments explain it to David. Greek mythology. The labyrinth. Well, exactly. So, and I don't know. The, so what is the labyrinth? So the minotaur is the mythical beast that lived in uh, in a maze created by Daedalus. Um, and he would kill the people that were sent into the maze. And so basically he's a minotaur and he's doing a book of mazes like because he just can't stop thinking about mazes. Once again, my audience is my audience is smarter than I am. I, I didn't know that. I don't know. Well, maybe this is uh, this is why it got uh, rejected. Um, this is a conversation to people. This is sort of a this is a conversation to people meeting kind of for the first time. And he's saying what he's do what he does. He says, on weekends, I teach unemployed teens the work skills they need to become unpaid interns. <laughs> I just, I thought it was I a nice comment that. on our work economy these right. days. I don't know. Right. Maybe, maybe, maybe somebody has interns and they don't want to. Uh, just, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. On right. Conan, we always made sure the interns were getting um, college credit for for you know, learning the ins and outs of of nightly television production. So at least there was that. Uh, but before there were people who were not even getting that. So right. Um, this one struck me as kind of cute. It's two boxers and the ref looking and he's just saying, OK, guys, last chance to use your words. <laughs> Very um, kindergarten teacher kind uh -huh, of. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Use your words. Uh. All right. This is a little trippy. I don't know what I was thinking when I drew this one. It's giant hands. You know how when you trap a spider with a jar? Uh, so these are giant hands trapping two people in a jar, slipping a piece of paper under, and the woman is saying, Whatever's happening, I think we're gonna live. <laughs> If you get, you know, if you go to that trouble, you're probably not going to kill them. Right. Or be tortured. Or be tortured, right. <laughs> <It could be. laughs> um, so I know you like animals. Yes. And I know you are uh, sort of morally opposed to hunting and meat and so on. So this is a, this should, you should enjoy this one. It's uh, two little cute bunnies standing on a dead hunter. And the caption is, let's get our story <laughs> Anytime I see a dead hunter, it's funny. I, I just love drawing the cute rabbits with the big eye. I don't usually do that. Yeah. So. <laughs> Boy, you're, you, you know, I've watched you grow as an artist. You're, you've gotten fant. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. As a matter of fact, I'm, I have to say this because, uh, first of all, thank you. I do feel I've gotten a little better as an artist. And as an example of that, I do want to show uh, a New Yorker cartoon that they accepted. And by the way, the the New Yorker's philosophy, as I've heard it said, is it's the think, not the ink. In other words, they prefer the joke or the idea for something more than the the skills of the artist, which definitely works in my favor. Um, but I did submit something, and it's kind of a a nod and smile joke that I that I liked. Um, and I submitted it, and they bought it. This is in December of 2021. And the New Yorker can hold a cartoon for months and sometimes in years. Um, 
So the one that they accepted looked like this. And it's just a, a guy at a hat store. And he's saying, I need a hat. I need to buy a hat so that the hat I can't find will turn up. Now, look at the drawing there. I, I, I've, that was in The New Yorker. That's the one in New Yorker. But they called me and said, we want to run it, but we want a more detailed background. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. And and so that and so check out the sort of the drawing style, the one dot I, the very vague thing. And then I had to redraw it. And this is what what it wound up looking yes. like. A little more shading, a little more same caption. Right. But, you know, 15 more hats and a store kind of thing. Right. So that's interesting. Uh, I I can point very to very few things where I can say, oh, I guess I am a little better than I used to be. But yeah. that one is a, is a good example of that. Great, um, great. Then uh, final two. Today's uh, Cinco de Mayo. So um, I thought, uh, I, you know, robot mariachi band and they're singing AI, 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 <laughs> AI. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Oh, and that, that got rejected. Really sure. It got rejected from today because I sent it as a, last night as a, hey, do it for the Cinco de Mayo, you know. Right. Um, but I guess the, I don't even know what they that they went with. Uh, right. But they have a web page called Daily Shouts. Right. So you really have two chances to get a cartoon in, either online or in the magazine. Um, and then I'll just end with this cute one. Um, it's dogs at a campfire there's one holding a flashlight under his chin and the dog is saying but the frisbee didn't come down it flew higher and higher <laughs> toward the garage roof <laughs> <laughs> the thing that would scare a dogs dog that yeah jose arroyo is the author of seething with joy how do people purchase that Oh boy, uh, seething with joy, and I think uh, twenty four uh, hours in, in Hollywood. Yes, yeah, somewhere in L.A., somewhere. a book of hours. That's the one that's available on the uh, the website that we don't care to name, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, it's the uh, the other bald person I hate. I should say um, somewhere yeah. in L.A. It's a book of hours is available on that uh, Amazon place and. Uh, and but also, if you just want to see the cartoons and a backlog of them, by all means, check out my Instagram, Jose Arroyo Writer, at Jose Arroyo Writer, and you'll see a backlog of stuff and some nonsense songs. And right now, I'm, I've been uh, picketing every day, so uh, I've I've been going out and and uh, you know showing my support for the writer strike. So right, and um, how long does it take to make? to do a cartoon? Well, from idea, so you get the idea and then it takes me uh, 90 minutes to three hours just to draw it, redraw it, white it out, and then put it on on a card, on a piece of, you know, Bristol board, it's called, this card. Most, by now, most people are doing it online on their, on their pads, you know, um, and it's sharper and cleaner and digital, but I am stubborn. And I also want to get good at drawing in any in any format. And I figured do, doing it by hand, uh, I don't know, it's just a little harder. And it's much harder because with these programs, you can select all and hit smooth. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So uh, I just I've decided I'm, I'm ornery and um, contrarian and I want to do it on paper. Fantastic. Jose Arroyo, thank, thank you. you. Let's do this more often. I would love to. I would love to have plenty of rejections. Okay. Thank you, Jose Arroyo. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye, Bye -bye, David. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. Professor Mike Steinel joins us. He is the author of Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. Buy the book. It has the Feldman guarantee. And buy the audio version of Saving Charlie Parker, a novel, because it has music like Turtle, which is one of my favorite songs. I can't play it, but uh, I love Turtle. So go buy the book and 
shall we call it the album? How, what, what do you call the multimedia? You know, uh, it's, it's a CD, but you can also <clears throat> buy it in digital form, <clears throat> you know, but album is, is still uh, um, my chair. Uh, I asked him a couple of years ago, do we still call them albums? And albums originally were a number of, it was called like an album because it was uh, when there were 78s, you would buy like a, it was like a book. And they had the, my parents had those, you know, you would have like five, you'd have um, five uh, 78 records with two sides. So you'd have 10 tracks, you know, and that was called an album. And so I still think you can call it an album. It's a group of, of, of songs. So I think that still works. It's great to see to you. It's, it, I've missed you. Th there were changes in the show that were necess necessitated by my having to go to go to work and not being able to do Mondays and th those Mondays and Thursday recording sessions that uh, were just it got too much for me. So of course, but of I, course. I I like doing the the Friday nights. We've kind of turned office hours into a, the show into the show. And yeah, that's good. It's a I'm getting positive feedback to it. it. The only drawback is I don't get to meet the audience the way I did at the traditional office hours. This is I a, gotcha. Sure. It's a more passive. So I haven't figured it out. There's been. Uh, there's been some structural changes that I initiated, and then there was a, a problem with the people who were uh, unhappy with me who were helping to get this uh, office. <laughs> so there have been some changes. And you had asked me before we started how we're doing the podcasts. And what I've decided to do is instead of doing two six-hour podcasts a week, uh, I had got some advice and I was told I was bearing talent that when people see a six-hour podcast, they they just don't know where to begin. And then I have you yeah, right. on. If I have you on in the third hour, uh, even if I put in time codes, people... It's uh, you have to set you have to set it properly, set the table properly. So what I've started to do is I'm posting the podcasts once a day and giving my guests uh, the the attention and the the table setting they deserve. So instead of some people don't like that, they they like the six hour version because they go on long drives and it's set it and forget it. But uh, it's kind of hard to be a guest on a show and promote it and tell your friends. And they go, I, 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 I waited four hours for yeah, you yeah. and you still weren't on. I mean, that's not really fair no, it's to, not. to my guests it's not. or to me. I mean, I would on Mondays and Thursdays, I was sitting for six to seven hours straight and I did that for two years and then the pandemic and sort but, of ended and I thought well it's time to do something but anyway. and before that before you were just doing like you would interview this person on this time and this time right. and then you would construct hey you know what I love is you you've brought back the uh, NASA stuff oh the NASA stuff oh yeah I love yeah. that yeah yeah and I still remember the one uh the guy says uh Anybody got any ideas, you know? Like, oh, right. Work the problem. That. Gene Work the problem. Yeah, it's Apollo yeah. 13. But when you listen to, I, I brought this up once before, when you listen to the whole thing, he says, does anybody have any ideas? There's like 90 seconds. And this one guy comes on kind of sheep. He's like, well, uh, there's a guy. I think he's got something. Yeah. It's really like, oh, my goodness. That's How scary was that? Our fine, I think, as they said, it was our finest moment. It's, it's such a great lesson <clears throat> in life. Apollo 13, when you you want one thing and you're not even thinking about the other thing and then the other thing happens and all of a sudden the most important thing is bringing three astronauts home alive and the moon become what? Who cares about the moon? We got to save these three men. It's 
at this point, it might be good to anybody who's listening to go back and listen to the episode where David had, uh, who'd you have? Uh, one of the astronauts. Yes. And I was, I was watching it. Uh, who, what's his name? I can't. Uh, hang on for one second. Okay. You got the same problem I got. <laughs> but it's a sp nobody has seen this episode on YouTube. Uh, it's, what do you mean uh, nobody's seen? I'll tell you, I, I, I'm not going to look it up. Uh, Apollo 13 was uh, uh, Schweiker. Yes, no, it wasn't right. Rusty Schweiker. That was the other astronaut we had from Apollo 8. I cannot believe I can't remember. It was James Lovell. Okay, I got to look it up. This is not That age. was a great episode. Well, I mean, you, were, you were so excited. You were you were like apoplectic as as that evening I, went on. I, I'm <laughs> I'm so ashamed that it's I Jim know, Lovell, I, I, Jack Swigert, and we had Fred Hayes. Fred Hayes, that's right. Fred Hayes. And this is not memory. This is uh, sleep deprivation. When I can't sleep, I can't remember. But nobody has seen this on YouTube. It has very uh, small number of viewers. Uh, they, in order for the Apollo 13 astronauts to make it home, they had to go around the moon and that gravitational pull of the moon. Like a slingshot. A sling, exactly. Shot them back to Earth. And s somebody at NASA recreated... <clears throat> what the Apollo 13 astronauts saw out their window. And I had Fred Hayes on the show, and he had never seen the video. And I played oh, wow. it for I, him. I remember that. Yeah, that, that's, he, yeah, that's right. He had never watched it. He had never. It was the first time since 1970 that he had seen the moon. And uh, it's on YouTube. Nobody watched, I think, 200 people. I have 200 views well, of Fred Hayes reliving. Uh, well, people who are listening to this now, go find that. Yeah, it's, uh, we've had, there's some amazing episodes that nobody uh, has watched or seen. I, I think it's because I haven't cut them properly and presented them properly. I think that's well, part of it. There's yeah. something to do in your. Hey, so I have a couple questions. Yes, and something, and one thing I, we, we important thing we need to discuss. I need to, but uh, so does the writer's strike affect you? Well, it doesn't affect the show since it's not. <laughs> there's not, this is, <laughs> not a union shop. It's not. But, we're, we're not. Uh, this is just the one before the the last writer's strike. Were you? Um, active in the guild there were you employed with during yeah. that time yeah and did you quit working everybody quits working yeah except the scabs and you know who they are i don't but you probably do yeah people the people in the yeah in the uh in the guild though you know so uh, yeah it, it i'm not talking about it yet because i'm a member of the west coast writers guild I'm on the East Coast, and there's an East Coast Writers Guild, and all my communications are with the West Coast, and I'm trying to get caught up with what's going on. And once I start talking about it, I'm going to, uh, I won't shut up about it. I'm kind of holding my fire until I know enough about it. Both guilds striking? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, there, it's 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 a nationwide strike. It's a nationwide strike. I was originally a member of the New York, the East Coast Guild. Then I became a member of the West Coast Guild. But now I'm living on the East Coast, and I'm still with the West Coast Guild. Anyway, it's, but uh, I don't know enough about it to speak about it. So I'm holding my my fire. And I'm afraid David, I have I'm, to. I'm, gonna, I'm afraid I'm going to go after some people and name names, and I want to make sure that I'm correct before I lash out. Good policy. No. Hey, David, I have a confession to make. Okay, my son. How I've, long has it? How long has it been since <laughs> your last? 
I've been uh, seeing another podcast. Oh. I have uh, another podcast is played. You by know, music. you you reeked of iTunes. <laughs> I knew that you. I, I smelled <laughs> iTunes on you. Yeah, the, 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 uh, I sent some music to the Tony Kornheiser podcast, which is about sports, but they play I, they play independent music. And I sent it on Wednesday, and I get ready to listen to the show. He does a one hour show, <clears throat> and at the end of the show, he does like five to ten minutes of what he calls the jingles. Right. And and there are tunes that people send in. Most of them are folky, and some are a hard rock. You know, just different things. And then you have a you write a little story in the email and he tells about the thing so i sent something off and son of a gun i i'm listening the next monday wow and there's my song wow i sent uh wow um uh, traveling light wow and he said some nice things and then they played the song they played the whole dang song but i mean that is like the greatest effing song i mean that is fantastic it's pretty good i like i like the words the words he's a he's a big lyric guy he he quotes every show he he reels off some lyric from a song i think he's he's the dates for him are like 1955 to 1972 he knows every pop song you know you know a Dylan song, and and it's something will. I mean, Traveling Light is one of the. I mean that if you listen to this show, I I think I played that. Oh yeah, you had every. You had a, I mean, you had a video it, with it. That yeah. and uh, um, you know I've I've I'm gonna send him some more songs. I'm not Good. gonna send the real political stuff, but I might do. Uh, well, you know, uh, it's not a political show, and maybe they would stay away from that, but. Um, it's a sports show. <clears throat> I was going to send Amazon hell, but you know, it's about Jeff Bezos. And then I remember he was, I think he no longer writes for the Washington post, but Tony Kornheiser and Mike Wilbon were the main, um, sports, um, writers for the, uh, Washington post. He still lives in Washington. You know, he talks a lot about the Nats, the Washington Nats, but anyway, so you're not, you're not going to kick me out and put my, well, move you, my stuff. You, you have to metaphorically. Talk, you have to talk to Mendelssohn, the the CEO <laughs> of Feldo Industries. Uh, my hands oh, yeah, are tied. I gotta, I gotta go to HR. You gotta go to HR and and, and clear. No, that's great. That that, that I, you know I, that's the other thing is like I don't have a big enough audience, and like that music should be. Those songs should be. How about Pig for Love? <laughs> you love Pig for Love. Pig, what about Pig for Love? I don't think I can do Pig for Love. Why? It's silly. It's really a silly song. I'm a, I'm a pig for love. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you. How many, how many weeks did you press on me to, uh, to you know, to write Pig for Love? Pig um, for and then love. finally I did it. And then you played it you over and over again. <laughs> I, I remember saying to somebody, um, <laughs> I, I'm a pig for love. What can I kind of said, what can I tell you? I'm a pig for love. <laughs> wasn't, was, Jose, wasn't Jose, I, see, this is bad now because this will be clipped from, and, and no, probably um, won't, no. but uh, go back if you're listening to this and, um, uh, Jose's his comics are fantastic. Well, Jose, yeah. there are two. I always say this: there are two comedy writers who taught me how to write. It's Jose Arroyo and Chris Kelly. Uh, Chris Kelly from Real Time with Bill Maher when I was over there, and uh, I was already at the Dennis Miller show. Jose came in. And he just brought a whole new way of thinking for me. His father is from Spain and Jose is bilingual. So language is very important to him. And the original writing rooms in the 50s were the sons and daughters, mostly sons, unfortunately, of immigrants. Yeah. who either spoke Italian or Yiddish. And so, or Ukrainian or some Eastern European language. 
So they had two languages going on in their heads while, while they were writing comedy. Jose is the first comedy writer and probably the only comedy writer I worked with who had two languages going on in his head. And you begin to see the magic of words and that puns, that all jokes are puns, all jokes are word plays, that words themselves are jokes. And when so you, do you think that by doing that, it simplifies, like I, I was thinking the brilliance of those two rabbits sitting on the dead hunter <laughs> and they go, let's get our story straight. Yeah. <laughs> or is it, we need to get our story straight. See, that's the thing about words it's probably a funny he probably I have to go back and look he i think it's we need funny, to get our i think i yeah we it's need funnier to, say we need to get our story straight right there's an urgency yeah. to that no he you is know, one of my yeah one of my favorite um cartoons from the new york was these two guys in business suits and they're at a like like a cocktail party you know whatever and the one guy's there's three guys and the one guy's introducing the third guy says this is Wilson from accounting, but everything he does is rooted in the blues. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know why that's funny, but that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, there are. So I had since Jose began writing, drawing cartoons, I had been begging him to do a man on his deathbed surrounded by his family in the hospital saying, I wish I had spent more time at the office. <laughs> and for years I said, do that, submit it to the New Yorker. And eventually someone, eventually that got into the, somebody else did, did it like 15 years later. Oh, oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, he's pretty brilliant. Amazing. Yeah, he is. And you're you, with somebody <clears throat> like Jose, you either uh, be envious, jealous and <laughs> wish him bad or just say because uh, it is a cut through, you know, comedy writing can be competitive. I would imagine it's very it's really not cutthroat. It, it, you have to get along with everybody. But. There's you can be jealous of somebody like him comes along and reminds you of what you're not. And so the, the, there's a tendency uh, to want to destroy somebody who is so talented. If I can't be as good as this person, I must destroy uh, this person. Is there let me ask you something is the dynamic. I noticed the dynamic in uh, <clears throat> in playing in a jazz group. Or with you know with like on a gig, is kind of most people don't give you any props. They figure you're on the gig, you know. So it's it's all even keeled. And if anything's if there's interaction, often it's kind of like uh, cutting. You know, like joking about somebody. You know, like um, like famous joke with the jazz musician. After you get done playing a solo, somebody says man, I really like what you were trying to do. Right. <laughs> trying you know, to that do. kind of <laughs> what you were trying to do, man. Really so, like what you were trying to do. So, you know, so that's the kind of stuff or, um, you know, just um, put down things. And, and in a way, they are more honest because the underlying thing is there. Oh, I'm making a comment, but if it'll sound phony if I say, right. That was the greatest solo I've ever heard because it was it wouldn't be, you know. Right. The, the, so, the compliment that I give is I, Cyrus and I were doing something two weeks ago and I read something that we he had written that I wish I had written. And I wrote, I'm going to give you the greatest compliment I can give a comedy writer. I wish you ill. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that tends to be how I compliment yeah. other comedy writers. I wish you ill. This was so good. I, I wish you ill. I don't think there's as much jealousy among musicians as there is among comedians not, and comedy writers. Lenny Bruce said to Mort Saul, every comic thinks there's only one gig 
I never forgot that. I went, wow. And I was a comedian, you know, I was like a full time yeah, comedian right, right. at the time. And I read that and I thought, wow, that really is how some comedians think. There's only one gig, even though there are, you know, a thousand comedy clubs. But if, if another comedian succeeds, uh, it's you, you, you go down a rung. And you're competing, you know, like you're competing to get the words into somebody's somebody's mouth. Into well, that's a comedy, writer. Right. That's a comedy right. writer. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, and you're when you if you're doing it yourself, it's you're solo, you know, like as opposed to a jazz group where and we talked about this last time, the right. interaction that has to be there. If it isn't there, it's not it's it's too stiff, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Um, yeah, you know, it's um, so and a lot of that's just unspoken interaction. You know, you know, um, you know, the two names, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. Yes. Yes. So they were kind of considered like the inventors of bebop. But and they actually they played in big bands together and they experimented on the bandstand and they um then they did have a brief thing where they played together. And the famous story is they they went to L.A. and it didn't go well. And and Bird uh, couldn't get uh, uh, his heroin and, and he disappeared. And when the band went back to New York, they just left him in L.A. and he ended up in in a state hospital. But anyway, um, when he was when Dizzy Gillespie was at North Texas as a guest artist, um, my boss at the time, Neil Slater, drove him around and, he, and Neil Slater had a lot of questions. And one of the questions was, he said, did you and Bird ever talk about what you're doing? And they said, no, we never talked about it. He said he'd play something and I'd smile and I'd play something and he'd smile. And then so the communication was at such a high level. They didn't it wasn't words were not needed, you know, Where everything's been said. Well, the, but they were playing new stuff. So they were right. like the reason the smile came was, oh, that's interesting how you did that. Why? Oh, where did that come from? How would you think of that? You know, how far and, ahead uh, were they of the audience? When did the audience catch up with them? Well, you know, it, it was there was a lot of press about bebop being uh, not jazz and being horrible, you know, like. Uh, Chinese music is what uh, Cab Calloway called it in an interview. And Louis Armstrong didn't like it. And a lot of, you know, it was revolutionary to the point that uh, it it wasn't accepted <clears throat> like the big band. The big band era that preceded it, that was pop music. That'd be like rock and roll. And, and bebop um got a, an intense following in the musicians and in the kind of the beatnik you know uh, the beatnik community in in New York and and when they like i said when they went to LA there was only the hipsters came out and uh but uh it didn't last they didn't draw big crowds as a matter of fact in the halfway through the run at Billy Bird, Burke's, Billy Bird, Billy Bird's, I can't remember. Um, it's off of, um, on Vine Street, Hollywood and Vine, um, just around the corner there. The building's probably still there, but his supper club, he, um, he even had them add a singer, you know, cause they wanted to, you know, and Bird and Charlie Parker wrote some arrangements for a singer, you know, trying to get it to, to, to get over, you know. Well, wow. so it took a, it took a long time, but by that fifties, uh, by the fifties, it had seeped in, and it was kind of, you know, like that was kind of the dividing line when jazz starts to get eclectic, meaning that you could have big band music still existing, and you could have traditional like New Orleans music still traditioning, mm -hmm. and then you'd have bebop. And then eventually Miles Davis, even when Miles Davis was doing his jazz rock, there were still guys, you know, playing like uh, Dixieland and, and you know, playing uh, in the clubs. And uh, there were still swing players, you know. So um, and we never have jazz really hasn't ever 
uh, departed from that eclectic period, which starts after the big bands kind of die away. And the, I suppose the line is uh, post World War II, 1948, 49, you know, and it just kind of spreads out. And it and and jazz never really has had the same popularity that it did in the early 30s and through the 30s, you know, with the big bands. Why? Yeah, anyway. I don't understand why it's not the only thing people listen to. Uh, well, it got undanceable for one thing. So it's okay. It got undanceable because it was just too fast, you know, and it was more for listening and it was in small clubs instead of big dance halls and uh, the styles changed and, and it also became more cerebral. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I used to tell my students that, you know, if you, if you grew up in the, if you came in a band in the twenties, like Bix Spiderbeck, those recordings, alternate recordings of the same song are almost identical. In other words, and they, they didn't write it out. They just put it together on the bandstand. Right. And then that group, it, by the time you get to bird their musicians get together to play, but there aren't set groups that list that, like the Basie band that was the same instrumentation and same personnel for decades and decades and decades. You know, the, his guitarist played with him for like 40 years. Right. Now, you and, were in uh, a rock band. Yeah, I was in a couple of them. I was in a lot of rock bands. You, you grew up with a father who was a music teacher. You're, you're steeped in, in theory. A lot of the music... A lot of the music from the 60s and the 70s. Well, a lot of the music from the 60s holds up. Oh, yeah. But this, does the music from the 70s hold up the way music from the 60s does? And my my phone is ringing. Uh, I'm, <laughs> hang on. It never rings. Is that a crank call? Uh, I don't know where my phone is. I, That's I, an old-fashioned ring. I know. I left the you ring. You the kind with the crank? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm the crank. Uh, I don't know where my um, phone is. Where's my phone? I don't know. I, I think... Were I you think able... The, were, were you and your father able to listen to music and say, this will always be good? Like, did did people know that the Beatles were always going to be great? When, when they came out. Can you tell when that music, because I'm surprised. Well, I think, here's what I think, is the music at any given time, if it gets popular, the people that are making it popular think, oh, this is always going to be great. Right. And yeah. some of it is, and a lot of it isn't. So when you go back and listen to uh, 1910 Fruit Gun Company, y you know. Yummy, yummy, yummy? Yeah. No, that's Tommy yeah. Rowe. Whatever, you know, or even Tommy Rowe. There's an example. Dizzy. I mean, it's it's nostalgic. It's good for nostalgia, but in terms of like, um, you know, like really uh, holding up, it, it it doesn't. Some of it will. I think some of the great rock and roll, the Beatles. But would you, was your father? Years, are there people who have palates that are so sophisticated they can hear a song and say this will hold up fifty years from now? It may not because of people's inability to recognize greatness, but this is a song that will endure. I, I think I think I can do that. I think I do that to some degree where I can. Some things just seem like Mar. I was I've been listening to Marvin Gaye, you know, like Mercy, Mercy Me, you know, and and uh, uh, what's going on. Mm -hmm. that's still great i mean it's fantastic you know and what is that like that's from the 60s is that is that how many is that 60 years no blah, 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 blah. right 60 years ago yeah right. the other well, night uh did roberta flack sing the first time i ever saw your yeah face? i think that was her hit and uh i don't know what i i think i was watching a trailer for a documentary about her and how Clint Eastwood heard that song on the radio and said, I want to build 
play Misty for me around that song. When, but not around Misty? Not around Misty. And, you know, when you hear that song, it's as clear as a bell that that is a masterpiece. Well, there's, first of all, there's the song. You can't, I mean, you the, hear that and you go, oh my God, you, like, how can anybody hear that song and not be, you know, broken by it? Right. But see, what I'm point, my point is, sometimes it's the song and sometimes it's the performance. Well, it's the performance. Like, for example. And on that like, one, it's the performance. Hello, Dolly was, or no, what was it? Mac the Knife was just kind of a, you right. know, kind of, it was a show tune and Louis Armstrong turns it into a masterpiece. Right. You know, or like, um, and there's a lot of examples of things he took, very simple things, and he turned, you know, um, he turned it into a masterpiece of the performance because he's interpreting it. Now, in, Bird ref in the song you're referring to, I think it's a combination of the song, which is a great song and a great performance and a great voice. You know, so it's a triple whammy. So sure, it's gonna it's gonna hold up, you know. I want to ask you about just because I'm. Uh, we'll talk about Dylan in a second, because I don't think people, when Dylan was at his height, knew that it would endure. Right? That 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 I I think most people with sophisticated palates would not. Get that Dylan would endure. A lot of people, a lot of my friends still don't. You know, right. <laughs> like they go, "You're into Dylan? What's, that's interesting." I think now it's kind of like, um, what is it? It's settled law, right? That he's great and influential. It's right. settled law. Even I, if you don't like it, it's settled law. I mean, you can listen to "Blood on the Tracks," which is what seventy four. So, and, yeah. and th that's undeniable. That's like a Beatles album where you just go, "All right, this is a." This is yeah, or blonde on blonde, yeah. yeah. Or what? What's at the, the time? I mean, first of all, you and lay lady you, lay, or is Jerry Lewis? You know, I was, always thought that was the stupidest song. I, I never. Let me women, do my Jerry Lewis version. <laughs> lay lady lay. Oh, go, go. Sorry, <laughs> that's so, good. Yeah. Jerry Lewis. You thought it was Dylan. a stupid that's song. Funny. Well, it didn't sound like Dylan. Yeah, but um, it's really interesting. Like when, when we do the, the shows with my Dylan band, we haven't done one for three years because of COVID, but might be doing one coming up. I don't know. Um, it's a lot of work preparing those. But anyway. Do you sing like I Dylan? A, Who does the singing? Well, Rosanna and Rosanna's husband, Gary, and another. We have sometimes four singers. We do stuff in parts. Right. You know. Um, do I sound like Dylan? I yeah, try to, I, I, could, I yeah. try to get his, you know, the thing about Dylan is that the pitch is inexact. It isn't about the pitch. It's about the conversational thing, like where he slips into, he slips into speaking, you know? And I think, um, um, I'm traveling light has a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, what, what did we play last week? Have we, have we done, um, uh, Oh, oh, what did we play last week? Uh, Talk is cheap. Definitely has some. I slip into speaking there, and it that builds the variety. You know, if I was, my voice is not. I'm no Pavarotti, so I'm not going to sing with a, a sustained tone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna try to get across by making it, um, you know, conversational. But um, right. anyway, but yeah, I think that you know the the. You realize how when Dylan had his motorcycle accident after that grueling tour in, in Europe uh, where they booed him and stuff. And uh, and then some he came back and supposedly that the motorcycle accident wasn't maybe as severe as they thought. He just wanted to have an excuse. Yeah. What were you told me that he was he, he tripped. Right. Well, it, he dropped the bike. It was a big bike and he's a little yeah, guy, you know, that it, wasn't and it doing, fell on him. Right. And and he came up the no one saw it. No one saw the accident. It wasn't there was another vehicle involved. But anyway, Albert Grossman was working him to death. So it's seven years, I think, with, that he doesn't except for the Isle of Wight. He doesn't appear live. And when he he finally 
just they announced the tour that he's going to do with the band, there was something like 500,000 requests for tickets for, I think, or 5 million. I remember that the, the, it's a staggering amount. It would be like, um, like 10 or 15. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in the millions that people wanted tickets and it was, they only had 500, the whole tour only had 500,000 seats. Cause it was in like, uh, the, the, the first one was in soldier field in, in, uh, Chicago and, and that tour, I'll get the, the exact figures on that, but it was the most in demand concert. Uh, and back then you had to mail in for tickets. It wasn't like you had Ticketmaster, you know? Right. So he was so popular from the records that had come out that, uh, and there was such a demand to see him. So that was a phenomenon. And those people, the deadheads, you know, like those are one thing, the people that like the Grateful Deads, the other people that follow Bob around are called Bobcats and (laughs) they call themselves Bobcats. And they'll go to, you know, if they had like a, they'll go to like a hundred concerts in their lifetime, you know, right. they'll just follow him around. Was it you who told me Woodstock was basically to get Dylan to come out and perform? No, 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 no. Because he was contractually obligated at the same time to play the Isle of Wight. And that was a weird thing. He, he rehearsed with, uh, I think Al Cooper's on that. They did a, uh, I can't remember. They, somebody's mansion they they rehearse for a couple of days it's if you listen to those recordings on the isle of white it's not good they do uh but i I, but I thought everybody went to woodstock initially the idea was that wasn't he living in woodstock he started the move to of all the people the folkies to move to woodstock he got he, so uh, he's because albert grossman he's had, to blame. Albert Gross, yeah and but then <laughs> Then he moved, he, he would find people like sneak into his living room and, right. you know, trying to get in through the chimney and stuff like that to, to just to talk to him. Maybe it was Santa. <laughs> you never know. Should Santa, we play, baby. Sh- should we? Uh... Yeah, let's play some music, baby. Okay, yeah. So this is uh, part two. Is this the same? This is Amazon Hell part two. Shall I explain what Pl- Amazon Hell Please, Hell's? yeah. Okay. Well, when I was trying to get my book published, I um, eventually I went with a book company called Dorrance Books, but it looked for a while that I might do self-publishing on it and just put it out and like on Book Baby. Well, then Book Baby, it turns out, is is Amazon. And at that time, we were pretty negative on Amazon. It, and, and I think we still are, but I think we've just resigned that it's so easy. Amazon is a great company. <laughs> support Jeff Bezos in everything, everything he does. He's a great man. <laughs> That's good. Hey, by the way, when the song is over, do you still have the applause? I miss the applause. Oh, uh, hang on. It's, we're, I really miss the applause. Okay, just, hang on. I, I was going through, if you give me a second, I might be able to get the applause. Uh, it's funny how I got so used to that. And then when it's not there, I go, like, oh, I guess it sucked. Uh, no, like yeah. I, well, uh, let me see here. Uh, so anyway, I'll keep explaining. Yeah, keep, about, yeah, so me, I did this song about Amazon hell and my troubles. And then I got, we had done one before where Rosanna um, Eckert, um, the singer in my band, great yeah, singer. Great, she's been she, on. She, um, we did a thing where we, it was the... Um, uh, digital asset song. Right. And I just would na- say the name Bitcoin and she would go, bit, bit, bit. she would scat the name of the, of the thing. And I said, let's do the same thing with the Amazon, all the different businesses that Jeff Bezos owns, which is like hundreds. He owns hundreds of businesses and they're funny names, some of them. And she said, okay, she did. So like a day later, she sent, I sent the bit bed off to her, the, the track with the trumpet and everything. And <clears throat> just with me saying the name. So, leaving space for her to do stuff. And she came back with this. Th- it's orchestrated into three voices sometimes, overdubbing, and they're funnier than I'll get at. I love when she talks about Whole Foods. <laughs> and uh, she's a genius. And she just knocked this out in a couple hours. 
And uh, I think the, the overall effect is pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, Amazon Hell Part 2. All right. I don't have applause. Well, then do this. I have this. Hang on. <laughs> why, why do you have that and not? I, I, I have to. I need to spend an afternoon going through my files. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I have files and files of sound effects. Just like wait. You used to have a machine. I have I, I, the machine. I have the I got the machine here. This might, this is the closest I have. Hang on. I mean, I have to go through, I've got the Hanna-Barbera sound effects. Uh, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> um, hang on. <laughs> All right. That uh, won't work. That doesn't work. That's fine. Just play the song. <laughs> Amazon Hell Part 2. Liquid Vista. Liquid Vista. Yep. Yep. 
push button. Push button. Push button. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Amiato. Amiato. Shoe fitter. Shoe fitter. App black. App black. Orbius. Orbius. Nice. Nice. That is incredible. That is amazing. Rosanna Eckerd. She's something else. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you hear that, does it make you happy? Or oh, what do yeah. You, you, oh, you're yeah. able to, to enjoy it without being hyper hearing. Do you hear things that normal people can't hear and... Well, you know, I <clears throat> often when I send these off, there's all sorts of things that I don't necessarily, that I'm not 100% happy with. And then I think over time, you forget about that. Right. That's why it's good to go into the studio. I've been told this, and it's true. You go into the studio, and then you put some stuff down. And the, when you play back in the studio, you're going to be disappointed because you're going to, your frame of reference is, oh, that turned out, that didn't turn out the way I wanted it to turn out. <clears throat> but then three months later, you forget about what you wanted it to turn out. And you can just enjoy it, you know? Right. It's, um, you're the best. You're the best. Oh, no, you're the best. Oh, no, you're the best. Mike Steinell is a jazz trumpeter, pianist, composer, and arranger. He's an internationally recognized jazz educator author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble and Building a Jazz Vocabulary. His latest book is a novel entitled Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. It has the Feldman guarantee. Buy it if it doesn't bring you tons and tons. Where is it? I have it somewhere. If it doesn't bring you joy, I'll reimburse you and get the multimedia version of Charlie Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinell. Thank you, David. Take care. Great. What a great way to end the week. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. You happy, self-actualized hump. <laughs>